Well, good morning, Whitefields Church. Happy Easter to you all. Christ has risen. He has risen indeed, right? So I say Christ is risen. You say? He is risen. Risen. Amen. Christ is risen. And so it's great to have you with us, and, and uh, the team is here to lead us in worship, and uh, we're looking forward to an amazing message from Pastor, Pastor Nick. But as is our custom, every, every Sunday morning we read a call to worship, and today's call to worship is from Job chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. So if you have your Bibles with you, read along with me, Job chapter, 20, uh, Job chapter 19, verses 25 through 27, and it goes like this. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Lord, we're just so thankful and so grateful for this morning. This, this is why we are, and we are who we are. We call you, Lord Jesus, because of this very day. You rose the... The, the tomb is empty this morning, and we want to rejoice in that. My Redeemer lives. We want to sing it out with all of our hearts this morning for your name, Jesus' name. Amen. I know you rescued my soul. I know you rescued my soul. His blood has covered my sin. I believe. Shame he's taken away. My pain is healing his name. I believe. I believe. I raise a banner. I'll raise a banner. Oh, 
saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because the no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he could open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God and they shall reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. The elders fell down and worshiped. And is 
in the resurrected life here this morning, Lord. Because the tomb is empty, we have new life. We can walk in your spirit, in the power of your spirit, a new life in Christ, covered by your righteousness and found perfect in the eyes of our Father in heaven. Oh, we thank you. We rejoice. Rejoice in this day, my Redeemer lives. Lord, you live. And we're so grateful, Lord. We're so grateful. Oh, we give you thanks. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Easter, Whitefields. I'm Isaac Nelson, and I serve as a missionary with Athletes in Action at their global headquarters in Xenia, Ohio. In the midst of everything that's going on, I'm so grateful that we get to celebrate our risen Savior, that by rising from the grave, He overcame the world. And so we proudly proclaim he is risen and in him we have hope. Happy Easter. Greetings, uh, I'm Nate Medlong serving here in Calvary Chapel, Hark of Ukraine. Just wanna say hello to everyone at Whitefields Community Church and say thank you for continuing to support us 
both financially and also in sending your pastor to us every year to help train and equip leaders here in Ukraine. We today are celebrating such a great day, remembering the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has given us hope beyond the grave, hope no matter what our outward circumstances are, that we have eternal life because of the sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus Christ today. God bless you. Hey guys, Lindsay here from Calvary Chapel Eger in Hungary. Just wanted to say happy Easter and I hope you're able to do what I'm trying to do and just slow down and try to remember what Jesus has done and that because of that we have nothing to fear. Uh, he has beaten death and we have a hope that does not disappoint. So let that be what we ponder this time. Happy Easter and God bless you all. Hello, Christ is risen. I am Levi Brinkerhoff, the associate pastor of Calvary Chapel in Sulawesi, Ukraine. Uh, Easter truly gives us reason to celebrate because Christ has defeated death by his resurrection. And more than that, he's changed the nature of death. Uh, Spurgeon says of death, I know that you're no longer able to destroy me, but you're sent as a messenger to lead me to the golden gate through which I will enter to see my Savior's unveiled face forever. Hey there, Whitefields Church. Benjamin Morrison here, uh, pastor of Calvary Chapel in Svidlovodsk, Ukraine. Just wanted to wish you all a happy Easter, even though we are not so celebrating our Easter here in Ukraine until next Sunday. Uh, but it is a wonderful time, uh, especially in light of everything that's happening in the world right now, uh, to remember that we have a Savior that has given us the hope of eternal life, has conquered death, and is coming again. God bless you all. Hello, Whitefields Community Church. My name is James Payne, and I am from Hungary. I am a Whitefields uh, missionary. I am a traveling musician uh, missionary with a band called Final Greetings. And I am super excited to celebrate um, with the church that our Redeemer lives. And uh, happy Easter, Whitefields Community Church. That's the traditional greeting here in Ukraine for Easter. It means... Uh, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. And we're the Marquis, and we live in Kiev, Ukraine, and it's a privilege that we can be part of your celebration there in the States. And for us, the resurrection of Jesus just gives us great hope. We look forward to the new heaven, new earth, where there's going to be no sickness, no death, and we'll just be able to spend eternity with Jesus Christ. So, Christos was Christ! Well, good morning. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Jesus is risen. He's risen indeed. Today, Christians all over the world are celebrating because this is the day when almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, having been executed by the Romans and the, the Jewish religious leaders together, being executed on a cross, buried in a grave, on the third day, he rose from the dead having defeated sin and death. And because he is alive, we can know that though we may die in the flesh, we will be raised again to new life as well. So would you please open with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. The book of Hebrews chapter 11. For this past month, past to four weeks, we have been going through a series Focusing on some verses in Hebrews 11, I wanted to continue here with our uh, Resurrection Sunday service in the same vein in Hebrews 11 and talk to you about this topic of why Easter is something worth celebrating. Why is Easter something worth celebrating? Would you please bow your heads with me and let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you. Lord, you are the risen king. You are the one who has risen from the dead. And thank you that because you have risen, we can have the hope of being raised by God to a better life as well. And so, Lord, we, we rejoice in that hope this morning as we gather in your name in the places where we're at. And we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As you know, we are living in very difficult times right now. This is an Easter like no other Easter we've ever had, at least that I can remember or that you, you can remember. Uh, there's a virus, of course, going around which is attacking the most vulnerable people in our society. More people have died in New York City from COVID-19 than died in the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Some people have called this year already, even though we're, we're still only in April, some people have called this year the year of death. 
And, and if you don't know someone who has contracted the virus, you certainly know someone who has lost their job. So many of us have been affected. Unemployment is at record levels. People are anxious. People are afraid. There's a lot of uncertainty in all of our lives right now. None of us know how long this is going to last or how this is going to be resolved at this point. And maybe you even wonder if Easter is about celebration. If Easter is a celebration, then maybe we should put it off until, until we're out of this crisis. Uh, I've actually heard people say that. They say, how can we celebrate at a time like this when there's so much suffering, so much death in the world? In fact, I've even heard about churches who have said, we're going to postpone Easter until after this crisis is over because it doesn't feel right to celebrate. And to that, I would say, no way. No way. And, and here's why. I'll tell you this, there is no more appropriate time for us to celebrate Easter, the resurrection of Jesus, than right now. In the midst of difficulties and trials, in the midst of sickness and pandemic and widespread loss of life, these are the things themselves which make Easter matter. These are the things which make Easter something worth celebrating. In fact, this may be the one moment in all of our lives where we feel and understand the weight and significance of Easter more than any other time in our lives. The title of today's message is The Hope of a Better Life. The Hope of a Better Life. And there are three things that this text shows us which help us understand what Easter is all about and why it's such good news. Three things help us understand uh, what Easter is all about and why it's such good news. The first is the hope of all the ages. The hope of all the ages. The second is the, the difference that hope makes. And thirdly, how to have this hope. So, so once again, those points. The hope of all the ages, the difference hope makes, and how to have this hope. First of all, let's talk about this, the hope of all the ages. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, we're reminded about some people throughout history who have trusted God in the midst of some very difficult situations. We're going to pick up in verse 29, and we'll read some of these verses. It says in verse 29, By faith, the people of Israel, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. Now, just stop right there. Maybe you remember the story. The people of Israel, having been slaves in Egypt, having been abused, mistreated, their children killed, themselves beaten and, and abused. They, God sent them Moses to be their liberator, to leave them out of slavery and into freedom. But as they were escaping from Egypt, they were being chased by the Egyptian army and, and they were getting away until they ran into an obstacle that there was no way to get around. Of course, that was the Red Sea. And at that moment, they were faced with an incredible dilemma because at their backs was certain death. At their backs was certain death, the Egyptian army bearing down on them. But at their front was also certain death. At their front was the, the Red Sea, something that none of them could swim across, not to mention that many of them couldn't probably even swim at all. So they're stuck they're stuck between certain death and certain death, and yet God opened the sea for them. He made a way through the sea for them to pass through, and they were able to escape to freedom. And their faith and their obedience to God led to their liberation from slavery in Egypt, and they were saved. Okay, cool story, right? Okay, next verse, verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. So this is another story, one of these familiar stories from the Old Testament. Jericho was a walled city, a fortress, impenetrable. And God told his people, here's how I want you to conquer this city. I want you to walk around it, playing your instruments, singing songs of praise and worship to God for seven days. You know, usually we use bombs, not songs, to conquer cities. And yet they trusted God. They obeyed God. They did what he told them to do. And as a result, they had victory in Jericho. Okay, then it goes on, verses 32 through 34. What more shall I say, it says, for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Okay, so each of the people mentioned here, they are people who trusted God and against all odds, 
God gave them victory. Victory snatched out of the jaws of defeat. Gideon follows God's instructions and he's able to defeat 10,000 Midianite soldiers with 300 untrained men. David, as a boy, fights and defeats Goliath, the giant. It mentions or refers to Daniel, who of course was thrown into a den of hungry lions because he refused to compromise his faith in God. And yet, God protected him. Then we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who also in the book of Daniel, they refuse to bow down to pagan gods. And so as a result, they're thrown into a fiery furnace and yet God preserved them. And there were others there who were saved from death from the edge of the sword. They were made strong. They were given victory. Why? Because they trusted in God and walked with him by faith and obeyed him and they refused to compromise. And there were even some, it says, in the first part of verse 35, who received back their dead by resurrection. These are people who were brought back to life from the dead. Amazing, amazing, incredible miracles. Life out of death. Victory snatched from the jaws of defeat. Where there was no way, God made a way. These people trusted God even in the face of death insurmountable circumstances and God made a way where there was no way. Now, if we were to stop right here though, we would be tempted to think that this is what faith does. This is what faith does. Whenever you have faith, whenever you obey God, you will end up like the people in these stories. If you trust God, if you obey God, then everything will always work out in your life. No, no matter how bad things look, God will make a way. Things will get better. Just trust God, obey him, and everything will work out except that's not the message of this section. You see, if you keep reading, because this isn't the end of the section, is it? We stopped halfway in the middle of it. If you keep reading, what you realize is that in this section, we actually have two lists. Two lists. Now, we just read the first list, but right after it, they're starting in the middle of verse 35, starts a second list. Let, let me read that list to you. Verse 35. There were some, however who were tortured and refused to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated. Those of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. You see what we have here? Our two lists. The first list is a list of people who trusted in God and obeyed God and their lives got better. God saved them from sickness, saved them from death, saved them from hardship. But the second list is also a list of people who trusted in God and obeyed God and yet their lives didn't get better. For some of them, in fact, it was expressly that, that they followed God that made their lives get worse. They were persecuted. They were killed. Some were saved from the edge of the sword because they had faith, and others were killed by the edge of the sword because they had faith. Whereas the first group trusted God and they were saved, the other group trusted God and they suffered. Right? The first group experienced victory, and the second group didn't. And yet they both had faith. They both obeyed God, and yet they experienced very different results. How do you make sense of that? How do you make sense of it? Well, the people in the second group they were just as faithful as the people in the first group. But, but look at what it says in verse 39. It says, all of these, all these, w all these, what does that mean? It means the first group and the second group. All these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us. Something better. What does that mean? All these did not receive what was promised. Again, the first group and the second group, none of them received what they hoped in, what, they, what was promised. It's talking about both groups of people. Neither of them, neither those who experienced victory and, and salvation from their problems, nor those who experienced suffering and pain, neither of them received the, the promise. Because, why? Because God promised us something better. What does that mean? We'll look back at verse 35, the second half of verse 35. It says that those who died in faith died in the hope that they would be raised again to a better life. Raised again to a better life. 
See, here's the thing. The people who escaped the mouths of lions, the people who escaped the fiery furnace, uh, those who were healed from their sicknesses, even those who were resurrected from the dead, where are they now? Can you go and meet them, say hello to them? Of course not. None of them are here anymore. You know why? Because they were saved from these things, but eventually something else took them out. Something else ended their lives. And what this is telling us is this. No matter what happens in your life here and now, whether your life is characterized by success and victory and good health, or whether your life is characterized by suffering and pain and hardship, the hope of the gospel, the promise of God, is not the promise of a comfortable and successful life here and now. It is something better than that. I want you to see that. It's not the promise of, of of a successful, comfortable, easy life. It's something better than that. The hope of the gospel is that when this life is over, we will be raised up to a better life. A better life. And a life in which viruses, poverty, injustice, and death are no more. If you look through the Bible, you can see that this is the hope that people had throughout the ages. For example, let me give you a, a few Old Testament examples. The, there's this book. It's, it's often thought to be the first book of the Bible that was written in, in chronology, right? Before even Genesis was written, it's thought that the book of Job was written. And the book of Job deals with a man named Job who suffered incredible loss. His property was destroyed. He lost all of his investments. Um, his, his children died. His wife turned against him. His health deteriorated. And yet Job says, in the midst of it, it says that Job refused to curse God. He refused to curse God. And here's why. Because Job said, as we read in our call to worship this morning, Job said, here's why. Because I know that God is my redeemer. That God is my redeemer. And when my life here on earth is over, when my flesh passes away, I know that I will see God face to face. And my soul longs for that day. See, Job believed that when this life ended, God would raise him up to a better life. And that hope shaped the way that he lived. Now, another example is David. David, King David. At one point, King David had a son who was sick in infancy and died. And, and while his son was sick, David fasted, he mourned, he prayed. But after his son died, his servants were afraid to tell him what had happened because they were afraid that he would be so devastated. But then they finally told him that his son had finally passed away. And David rose up, washed his face, and he said, uh, he, will not come, uh, or sorry, he will not come back to me, but I will go to him. He will not come back to me, but I will go to him. You see, David's hope his belief was in the promise of being raised up to a better life when this earthly life is over. You know, I, I found that the response to this COVID-19 crisis has been interesting. I, I found it interesting uh, from this perspective. We have shut down the entire world. We have purposefully shut down our, our economy, the world economy. We have altered the lives of almost every single person on the earth you consider this 8 billion people on the earth. And, and so what that means is that the number of people who are being affected by this is relatively small. Now I, now, I don't say that we shouldn't do this. I'm just saying the number is relatively small. And so what that means is we have shut down our economy. We have um, taken on, you know, a financial loss. We have shut down the whole world to save the lives of a relatively small number of people. Now what that shows us is that as human beings, we believe that life is precious. Life is something that should not end, we don't think. We don't want it to end. We don't believe it should end. When even one person dies, we mourn that loss of life. You see, we believe deep down that there is something wrong with death. There's something wrong with death. We believe that there's something wrong with sickness. And, and that's, that's interesting because when you think about that, death, sickness, even viruses like the, the pandemic we're experiencing now, these things are natural occurrences. And yet on the other hand, we believe that we should do everything in our power to stop sickness and prevent death. In other words, we want to live. It's been said that uh, 
despite the cost of living, it still remains quite popular, right? So, uh, you know, we want to live. And, and, and yet there are things that we look at in the world and we say, these things are not good. They're not right. They shouldn't be. You see, deep down, what every single person longs for in our heart of hearts, what we long for is a better life. A better life. If you look at the art we make, it reflects this hope, this belief in a better life. Or if you look at the movies we make, the stories we tell, the books we write as human beings, they all reveal this desire for a better life. A life in which good defeats evil. A life in which there is love that never ends, that doesn't get cut off. A life in which you know, we can overcome the physical limitations of this world and of these physical bodies. Deep down, we all sense that the world that we live in is broken, that even we ourselves are not who we should be. We believe that death is a thief and that we were made for more than this. And yet, no matter how much we want those things, death is always looming on the horizon like a dark cloud just on the horizon. And we know that eventually, if enough time goes by, it will steal from us every single thing, every single person that we love, and it will eventually swallow us up as well. It is the ultimate enemy. It destroys what we love. It steals what we love. And ultimately, it will destroy us. And there is no way around it. But God's promise through the ages, God's promise through the ages was that one day he would intervene. He would break the power of death and he would make a way for us to rise again to a better life. And these people whose stories we read here in Hebrews chapter 11, that was their hope. Their hope was not in a better life here and now. Their hope was in something better than that. Their hope was that when this life is over, that God would raise them up, that God will raise us up to a better life. Their hope was in eternal life with God where all things are made right and where death is no more. We're told in verse 40 of Hebrews chapter 11 that the good news of the gospel is that God has provided something better. God has provided something better for us in Jesus. Friends, this is why Easter is something we're celebrating. This is why Easter is good news, especially in difficult times like right now. These are the times when Easter matters, when, when we feel the weight of Easter. Here's why. Because the reason we celebrate Easter is because Jesus not only died for our sins, but he rose from the, from the grave. Why is that important? Because it means that death has been defeated. And just as Jesus rose from the grave, God will also rise, raise us up from death to eternal life. Here's how Paul the Apostle explained it in uh, 2 Timothy 1 verse 10. He said this, Our Savior, Jesus Christ, destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Life and immortality. He destroyed death. See, what the resurrection of Jesus means is that the hope of all the ages is now a reality. The hope of all the ages is now a reality. This is why Easter is good news because it means that there is hope beyond the grave. There's hope beyond the grave. It means that this life is not all that there is, but that God has prepared for us something better. In the eighth chapter, of Paul's letter to the Romans. Paul talks about how all of creation, including all of us, we groan, we groan under the weight of this broken world. We groan longing eagerly for God to set us free from what he calls this bondage to corruption. And he says there in Romans 8 verse 24, it is in this hope that we were saved. This is the hope that we were saved in, that God would set us free from this bondage to corruption under which we groan under the weight of it. The promise of the gospel is not that God will give you a perfect life here on earth. That's not what Christianity promises. It promises something better than that. Do you realize something better than that? It's the promise that when this earthly life is finished, he will raise you up to a better life. That is an incredible promise. And if it's true, it would absolutely change the way that you live. It would absolutely change your perspective on everything. But how can we know that it's true? How can we know that this isn't just, you know, um, 
you know, trying to opium for the people, right? An opiate for the people, trying to placate us, make us feel better. An empty promise just made to help to, that is existing just to help us feel better about our terrible existence and the, you know, certainty of death. Well, the answer, the reason why we can be certain is because of Easter. Easter is the answer. Easter is the reason why we can be sure this promise is actually true. See, what makes Christianity unique is that Our hope as Christians is not just based on abstract ideas. It's not just based on taking somebody's word for it. It is based on historical events. Historical events which actually happened in real places on certain dates, places which you can still go visit today. There was a real person named Jesus of Nazareth who was written about, not just by those who wrote the Gospels, but by other people as well. He was talked about and he was executed on a cross in Jerusalem publicly with many people watching. He was buried in a tomb. And on the third day, he rose from that grave. And many people saw him after he was risen, beginning with some of the female disciples. Then Jesus went to the place where the 11 disciples, minus remember, minus Judas, who betrayed him. So the 11 disciples were gathered He went to that place. He ate a meal with them. And then for 40 days, he appeared to hundreds, perhaps even thousands of people. We know of one occasion where he showed up and there were 500 people who saw him all at once. Even people who didn't like Jesus couldn't argue with that. They couldn't deny that the grave was empty and there were all these people walking around Jerusalem who were eyewitnesses, who who had seen him, who had touched him within those days. And the Roman government and the Jewish religious leaders, right, they did everything they could to suppress Christianity, to stop it from growing, to shut it down. And yet the only thing they needed to do in order to do that was just to prove that Jesus hadn't actually risen from the grave. The whole thing would be over. We wouldn't be celebrating today. Christianity wouldn't even be a thing. And yet, everywhere they turned, there were these people who even in the face of torture, even in the face of death, refused to recant their testimony that they had seen Jesus alive. They said, how can we not talk about this? We saw him with our own eyes. We touched him with our hands. We heard him with our ears. We were there. He was there. You see, If they wanted to shut Christianity down, it would have been really simple. Just prove that Jesus hadn't risen, and yet they could not do that. And all of the evidence points to the fact that he did truly rise from the grave. And because Jesus rose from the grave, you can be sure that God's promise to raise you up to a better life is actually true. This is the hope of all the ages, and this is the hope of all of us. Paul the Apostle, he put it this way, If we hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Most to be pitied. If this life is all there is, that's a tragedy. But the good news of the gospel is that because Jesus rose, we can be sure that God will raise us up as well to a better life the life that we long for in the depth of our being, in the depth of our soul. Okay, that's our first point. Our last two points will be much shorter. Number two, the difference that hope makes. Hope can be defined as the expectation of coming good. The expectation of coming good. Hope is what keeps us going in the midst of hardship. You know, likewise, the lack of hope Hopelessness is the leading cause of things like depression, suicide, destructive behavior. See, right now, the thing that's keeping us going through this whole coronavirus situation is the hope that it's not going to last forever, that there, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, that we can get through this. You know, it's been said that people can persevere through almost anything if they have hope the expectation of coming good. Now, all these people in Hebrews chapter 11 that we read about, we can see in their lives the difference that hope makes. We can see people who endured torture, people who faced death, and they they were sawed in half, right, in the case of, of Isaiah, and yet they didn't waver in their convictions. They didn't shrink back. The reason they were able to endure these things was because they had hope, in God's promise that he would raise them up to a better life. That's the difference that hope makes. If you have the hope of the resurrection, 
because Jesus defeated death and rose from the grave, what it does in your life is it enables you to be bold and fearless and obey God and follow God's calling on your life because you know that you have absolutely nothing to lose. You see, when you have the hope of the resurrection, you're free. You are free to pour out your life in service to others. You are free to do good and to love without reservation. You're free to give and not hold back because you know that when this life is over, you will, re you will be raised up by God to a better life, a better life with him forever where there are pleasures forevermore. The hope of the resurrection, on the one hand, it makes you absolutely fearless. And on the other hand, it gives you a sense of mission and purpose and direction for your life. It makes you absolutely fearless because it means you have nothing to lose. Just recently, I read a funeral message. It was a transcript of a funeral message that was given a few years ago. And the, the funeral message was given by the son of the woman who had died. Her name was Lois. Her son's name was Jonathan. And he's a young preacher. And his mom had died of cancer. So he was a Christian. She was a believer. And he's, you know, doing the, he's eulogizing her at her funeral. And this is what he said at her funeral. He said, before his mom died, he had been praying for her, that God would heal her. For a long time, God heal her. God heal her. He had been praying that God would heal her. And one day, he came to this realization. He felt like God spoke this to him. That Either God was going to answer his prayer one of two ways, but God was certainly going to answer his prayer because of Jesus. Either his mother would be healed or his mother would be healed. Either she would live or she would live. Either she would get to come home and be with family or she would get to go home and be with family. Either she would be taken care of or she would be taken care of because the victory is Jesus as he already won the victory. He defeated death and because he was victorious over death, as Paul the apostle says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than conquerors. What does it mean to be more than a conqueror? Like where can you go from there, right? Here's what it means. It means that we cannot lose. We cannot lose. We've already won. Paul the Apostle, he put it this way. He said, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You could put it this way. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, the worst thing that could ever happen to you is actually the best thing that could ever happen to you. And if that's true, then you have nothing to fear. If the worst thing that could ever happen to you becomes the best thing that could ever happen to you, then you're bulletproof, right? Death, death used to be an executioner, but because of Jesus, death is no longer an executioner. Death is now just a garden that plants us so that we can rise up again later, more beautiful, more glorious because of what Jesus did. You see, because of Jesus, death is no longer an executioner for us. It's just a gardener. And here's the other thing. God uses even the hardships in our lives for, for good. Even the suffering in our lives for good. And that means that you have absolutely nothing to fear. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians 15, right, Paul the Apostle says, death has been swallowed up in victory. And he says, oh, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Do you see what he's doing there? He is mocking death. He is making fun of death. That is the confidence that we have as Christians because of what Jesus did, because of his resurrection. It makes us absolutely fearless. We can mock, we can make fun of death because we are more than conquerors. Because of Jesus, the worst things that could ever happen to you are also the best things that could ever happen to you. You cannot lose because he already won. And Jesus' resurrection, here's the other thing it does. It gives you a sense of mission and purpose. See, when you understand that your best life is not now, it can't be now, it is the one that is to come when he will raise you up to that better life. You know what it does? It sets you free from having to work so hard right now to, to manufacture your best life now. It sets you free to say, God, since you have provided something better for me in Jesus, since I know that in that better life, all of my deepest longings will be fulfilled 
God, how do you want to use me now? How do you want to use my life? How do you want to pour me out for the sake of other people? How do you want to use me in your mission? Because you will raise me up to a better life. That sets me free to love and to give generously. That's why Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I die, I win. But as long as there's breath in my lungs, I have a purpose. I have a mission for me to live is Christ. To live for him who died for me. To be his hands and his feet. To be a conduit for his love and blessings into this world for people who desperately need them. To be a conduit through whom he speaks to other people the the words of life. Here's the ironic thing. The more you pour yourself out for God and for other people, the more full you will be. The more you pour out, the more full you will be. But, Conversely, the more you focus on your own needs, the more you focus on what other people need to do for you, your own happiness, the more miserable you will be. Jesus put it this way. He said, if you cling to this life, you will lose it. If you cling, right, as hard as you can to this life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, you will save it. See, true enriching, meaningful, joyful life is not found in serving yourself, but is found in giving yourself, giving your life to God and for God for his purposes and his mission in the world to bring love and truth and hope to others. And then finally, the last point here is this, how to have this hope, how to have this hope. Hebrews 11 tells us that these people who had this hope they had it, they had this promise. It says they obtained it through faith. They obtained it through faith. What does it mean to have faith in something? To have faith in something means to trust in, to cling to, to rely upon something. See, these people at that time, they had faith in God's promise that he would someday save them. But now for us, now that Jesus has come, right, the substance of that promise, now that Jesus has lived and died and was resurrected, rose from the grave, our faith is not only in God's promise, it is in, now it is in God's actions by which he fulfilled that promise. So in order for you to have that hope, in order, to you, in order for you to receive this promise of being resurrected to a better life when this life is over, what is necessary is for you to put your faith in Jesus and what he did for you in his life and death and resurrection. Rather than trusting in yourself and your own goodness or your own ability, it means trusting in him and what he did for you. He lived the life that you should have lived, a life of perfect obedience to God. And he died the death that you should have died in your place to pay the price for your sins. And on the third day, He rose from the grave, defeating death and making a way for you so that when this life is over, you can be raised to eternal life, to that better life, which all of us long for. How I'd like to finish our time today is is like this. I'd like to lead you in a prayer, a prayer of repentance, a prayer of faith, a prayer of receiving God's grace and this gift that he has given us in Jesus. And and, and my belief is this, that this is not just something that a person needs to do once in their lifetime and then you've ticked the box and you don't do it again. No, I'd say that receiving God's grace by faith is something we do continuously. And so I'd like to just lead in this prayer and I'd like you, wherever you're at, to pray this along with me. It's a prayer of receiving the gospel, putting your faith in Jesus and what he's done for you. So I'm gonna pray and I'd encourage you, bow your heads, close your eyes and pray along with me and make this prayer the prayer of your heart as well. God Almighty, we thank you. I thank you, God, for loving me. And I admit that I have sinned And I have fallen short. But I thank you that you came to save me from the curse of sin and death. Jesus, I trust in what you did in your life, in your death, in your resurrection to save me and bring me into eternal life, into relationship with you forever. And I give you my life and I ask that you would be my Lord. Lord, I ask that you would lead me I ask that you would help me to walk in your ways, 
until that day when I see you face to face and experience the fullness of that better life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Happy Resurrection Sunday, and may we go from this moment celebrating this as we move forward through the rest of our life, that he is risen, and because of that, we have the promise, the true hope of a better life, which is to come. God bless you. My covenant of peace